take them while they're cheap. You, that's well. That's right. In two minutes. Yes, five bucks. <laughs> people who really have the right to wear flamingos on their shirt on Sunday morning. <laughs> I'm going to draw attention do you, to that. <laughs> do you realize, do you realize that you may be the first organist in a Presbyterian church to wear flamingos on their shirt <laughs> on Sunday morning? I'm quite sure that it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> Wait did you feel that? That was John Calvin turning. <laughs> but not Charles Wesley, he'd love it. <laughs> well, welcome in the name of Jesus Christ. I uh, have uh, an, really an important announcement to make right now that my, my lovely wife, hi, <laughs> uh, she uh, told me, um, if you, <laughs> I'm, I, look, I'll take points any way I can get them. Uh, the, um, if you notice the bulletin is, is a little bit of a puzzle this morning. And, and you know, I, I, I don't want to point fingers, but I did give them to Tom to bring out. <laughs> so... Uh, I, I, ha I have misstapled the bulletin. Uh, and you could tell by the numbers on the bottom. Because it goes from page one to page what? Four. Four. Thank you very much. And then if you turn it, 
it goes to page five and then to page two. Okay, well, we have options, right? We have options. Uh, what, what we can do is you can take the page out. And if, I'll tell you, if you choose this option, and don't do it yet, you choose this option, do it, well, my wife already has. Uh, if you do take that option, do it with some anger. You know, don't, don't just gently do it. Do it like this. You know, like you're just disgusted by it. Uh, that's one option. Uh, the, another option is just when we finish page one to do what? Turn to page two. It's in there. You know, which, which is one option you could do. If you choose that option, you won't be tearing anything out, but when you turn the page, look like you're disgusted. <laughs> you know, because you, you, you didn't have to expect, you didn't expect to do that. But it's, it's you may not have even come if you knew you had to turn the page right. <laughs> the third option, and I'm not thinking this is the best. The third option is that we just kind of, you all, you all just sit around. Maybe this is the one, in fact, after, after I think about it, this may be the one you choose. Uh, you all just sit around. Uh, and I'll reprint the bulletins <laughs> and staple them correctly. Now, I thought that, yeah, you wouldn't want to do that. But while I do that, Ron may be playing, which may be what you'd like to hear anyway. So, uh, I've got to figure this out, which one you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, Ron, tear the page out with attitude. No, no, no. Oh, oh, okay. All right, all right, all right. All right. <laughs> we're, we're, do, we're doing To God Be the Glory. First. There's two versions. Oh, really? So I, I well, got play the, play, I'll tell you, play verse one, one version, verse two, the other. I got it. You know. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So that's one, that's one announcement I have for you. The other announcement, and this actually is far more important. You know, there are certain things that you remember uh, as you go through life. You know, as an event occurs, and you say, I remember where I was when this event occurred. I remember where I was. And you carry that with you your entire life. And, and we are actually at that point now. Because I understand it's Tom's birthday today. Oh. <laughs> I, I told you wanted to give it a big build up. <laughs> yes, uh, so if, if we could, you know, and I want you to remember, you were here on this Sunday when it was time for it. So with that in mind, uh, Ron, can you play Happy Birthday? And that calls for full organ, too. Full <laughs> organ, yeah, well, because he's a clerk of session. I know. He is, a, other than screwing up the bulletins, he is doing a, he's great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's, let's sing. Happy birthday. Well, any other announcements? I mean, it's hard to beat these two. Uh, well, then, brothers and sisters, uh, let's worship God together, and we'll do that through our call, our call to worship. This comes from the uh, uh, 22nd Psalm. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear me. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow down all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him.
Now, let's all stand and let's sing whatever version Ron plays <laughs> of, to, to God be the glory. And remember, in mid him, you've got to do what? Turn the page. Thank you. How many, how many verses do you have? Down? I got two. two. Okay, all right. may be seated. And just a little bit, we're going to hear God's word read and proclaim. But before we get to that part of the service, it's right and appropriate that we go to God in prayer, kind of to prepare ourselves. And the first prayer we're going to make is a prayer of confession so that we can kind of clean ourselves out a little bit, sort of clean out our ears so that we can hear God's word. Uh, now, since we commit sins both as individuals and as communities, it's right that we pray in two ways. So we'll start by praying the prayer that's in the bulletin so that we can pray together, and then we'll follow it with just a brief time for silent and personal prayer. So, brothers and sisters, as God's people, let's go before him now in prayer. <clears throat> Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you. Although we say that you're in control, we don't live as though we believe it. We're timid as we go about doing your work, and we worry about the future. As a result, we convey unhappiness to those around us. Loving Father, forgive us, and help us to respond to you with confidence and hope. Lord God, in this time that follows, Hear now these prayers we lift up to you, and, and Lord, have mercy upon us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for listening to us, and of course, thank you for loving us as much as you do. But right now, Lord, thank you for forgiving us. And we believe that we have been forgiven because we've confessed these sins in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In his name, we now pray. Amen.
You all may be seated. Now, we've lifted our sins up to God in prayer. Now we have the opportunity to lift up to Him our needs and concerns, but also reasons for joy. So, are, are there any particular needs or concerns that anybody here might have that we'd want to lift up and remember? Yeah, Tim. So we want to lift up Cindy in our prayers. Thank you. Any, anything else? Any, any other situation that we might want to remember? The family of Gary Fellows. The, the family of Gary? Yeah, Gary passed away this week unexpectedly. And he was a well-known individual in our community. So we want to remember his family and his friends. Gary's fine. You know, Gary's in the hands of God. Uh, but he leaves a hole. And so for those who are grieving that loss, I want to lift him up in our prayers. Thank you. Or them in our prayers. Are there any other needs or concerns? Yeah. Um, I just want um, people to remember this week um, at WVU, they're taking finals. So we'd appreciate prayers for Maggie's retention and, <laughs> and uh, concentration. concentration. Yes, and, yes. Uh, Avoiding distractions. Yes, yes, yes. Could you well? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and for all, all everybody in college that that are facing exams, that can be a can be a rough time. Uh, that's when you said most prayers are said, right? <laughs> yeah, that's. I, I, you know, it always has interest me. I mean, people talk about uh, we need, we've taken prayer out of school. We've taken prayer out of school. We gotta we gotta put prayer back at school. And, and I always find that very, very interesting because I'm an old school teacher. And I will tell you with absolute certainty, as long as teachers give tests, there is prayer in school. <laughs> I, I will guarantee, take you to the bank, there's a lot of praying going on in school and sometimes it's the least likely people. Praying. <laughs> so, uh, yes, we want to we wanna make sure we lift them up in our prayers. Well, with these in mind, uh, and also the concerns we know, let's go to God now in prayer. And I'll, I'll open, pray for a little bit. Uh, then you all have the opportunity to lift your concerns to God. And we'll close by praying the Lord's Prayer together. So, as God's people, let's approach him now in prayer. Lord God, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to be here this morning. What a drop-down gorgeous day. We, we, we thank you so much for that. It just makes you feel good to, to be alive when you see a day like this. Uh, of course, Lord, not everything we see is necessarily good. Uh, as we look out into the world, sometimes it seems like a harsh and, and scary place. And even when we look inside your church, my goodness gracious, we wonder what's happening. Uh, we look at, at numbers, and the numbers have, uh, have dropped dramatically of folks being involved. And, and that's, a, that's a, at, at the very least, discouraging, if not frightening idea that uh, we're in, in such decline. Uh, scares us. So what we're going to ask that you do is we're going to ask that you, that you strengthen us so that we're not swept away by what we hear and what we see. Instead, help us to concentrate our attention on, on you. And also help us to recognize that, that some of the things that we may consider really harsh and scary, that may all be part of your plan to prepare us for a new and different future. So help us to be willing to, to move as you lead us. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. And now in the privacy of our hearts, we're going to lift up to you the concerns that we heard shared. We're also going to lay before you those things that weigh heavy on our heart. Lord God, hear us now as we pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for loving us as much as you do. And thank you for listening to us when we 
when we offer our prayers. But right now, Lord, thank you for responding to our needs. And, and we know that you will. Because we've lifted these needs in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray, pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, again, as I've said for, gosh, I think every Sunday I've been here. Normally, when things settle back down to normal, people will be passing plates, but we're, we're still not doing that yet. Uh, instead, we got a basket there. You are absolutely welcome to, uh, to drop in an offering in that, in that basket. Uh, we will certainly see that it's put to good, good use. So with, with that in mind, let's all stand and let's sing the doxology. may be seated. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the gospel according to John, the 15th chapter beginning with the first verse. <clears throat> now I printed the, uh, the passage there in your bulletin beginning on page three and then you can turn over and see the rest of it a little earlier in, the, in your bulletin. Um, the, uh, it's from the contemporary English version. That's what I'm going to be using. Now, if you brought your own Bibles, and that's, that's wonderful to bring your Bibles to church, you feel free to read in whatever translation you have. So, hear now the Word of God first as written by the um, evangelist John. Jesus said to his disciples, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts away every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. But he trims clean every branch that produces, that does produce fruit, so that it will produce even more fruit. You are already clean because of what I have said to you. Stay joined to me, and I will stay joined to you. Just as a branch cannot produce fruit unless it stays joined to the vine, you cannot produce fruit unless you stay joined to me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you stay joined to me and I stay joined to you, then you will produce lots of fruit. But you cannot do anything without me. If you don't stay joined to me, you will be thrown away. You will be like dry branches that are gathered up and burned in a fire. Stay joined to me, and let my teachings become part of you. Then you could pray for whatever you want and your prayer will be answered. When you become fruitful disciples of mine, my Father will be honored. Amen. Praise God for this reading from his word. Well, I think I can now say with absolute certainty that we have turned the corner and that spring has finally what? sprung. Right? Now I know according to the calendar this happened back in March and in fact I think I even mentioned that we had turned the corner before and entered spring a few weeks ago but you got to remember you know there was actually some snow on the ground between then and today but now man the only thing on the ground is a lot of green grass. Of course, that will have to be mowed until the middle of October. <laughs> of 
But I'll tell you, grass isn't the only thing growing. I mean, just look around. I'll tell you, from my little office at my house, I could see the guy across the street from where I live, and he is working, he is really working hard in his yard, moving stuff and all kinds of things. And the father and son that live next door, I'm telling you, since the dad is retired, he is cutting and planting and trimming all the time. Makes me tired just watching it. In fact, his yard looks so good, I wish we lived on the other side of the street. Let's, let's just say my passion for, for yard work has waned as I've gotten older. But you know, that wasn't the case about 13 years ago when we first moved into our house there in Weirton. I mean, I was pretty gung-ho when it came to the yard. I mean, I, I remember when we moved in my uh, first spring there, and Debbie remembers this, I, I, I bought and, and put in a whole bunch of azaleas and hydrangeas and, and these little bitty rose bush roots. You know what I'm talking about? But I could tell you, of all the stuff I planted, I was most proud of my guess. Lilac bush. I mean, that's the title of the sermon, right? You see, when we moved in, we had one out in the front. The previous owner had one out in the front. And in the back, you know, kind of off the alley, you know what I'm talking about, uh, there was this great big wooden planter kind of thing. Big round wooden thing. But there was nothing in it. And so I bought this tiny little lilac looked more like a stick than a shrub. And I planted it, and I watered it, and over the years, I watched it grow. And every spring about this time of year, it would blossom. And I'll tell you, every time it did, I felt this sense of pride. Because even though nearly all the azaleas and the hydrangeas and the rose bushes ended up joining the choir triumphant, in other words, they became compost, my lilac flourished. Not our lilac, my lilac flourished until about two and a half years ago. You see, I had a friend, well, I still have him. I just haven't seen him lately. Uh, I had a friend over in Weirton who I think you could say, well, was a little down on his luck. And so I would help him as, as much as I could. For example, since he didn't have a car, when he'd go to visit his daughter in Philadelphia, I'd drive him down to Wheeling so that he could catch the bus. And, and since, and y'all may not know that, the bus leaves Wheeling going east really early. We would stop at Biscuit World there in, in Weirton uh, for breakfast. I'd buy us breakfast. And then when we got down to Wheeling, I'd always give him some money so that he could have, you know, a meal, a lunch on the trip to, to Philly. Now, over the years, I think we did that about, oh, maybe half a dozen times. Well, a couple of years ago, I remember he came over to the office there on Main Street in, in Weirton, and he told me that he wanted to repay me for, for what I had done for him. And since he was a landscaper, or had been a landscaper, he offered to do some work around my, my house, you know, yard work. I think it was sometime in September. It was sometime in September. Anyway, uh, since my passion for yard work had already waned by then, man, him telling me that, it was like putting pig in, uh, a slop in front of a pig. I told him that would be great. And so one day I picked him up. We made the arrangements. I picked him up. I took him to our house, and I opened up the garage so he could use whatever tools in there he needed to do his work. Now, this was in the morning, and I told him that when he was finished, 
uh, he could either walk home, we live on Marlin Heights, so he could go down, either go down the hill or uh, wait until I would come home a little later. Well, about 3.30 in the afternoon, he called me to tell me that the work had been done and he'd walked home. And that he was really, really excited to hear what I thought of, uh, of what he had done. And so somewhere around 7 o'clock, I came home. I got home. You know, and in September at 7 o'clock, it's still light outside. So I could see everything that he had done. And I've got to tell you, when I looked around at my yard, he had done a magnificent job. He had done this great job. I mean, he had cleaned out all the flower beds and they were a mess with leaves and all kinds of stuff. Dead azaleas and hydrangeas, all that stuff. And the sidewalk had been edged. I'll tell you, it looked as good as the house next door. There was just one problem. He had really cut back my lilac bush. Now, to be honest with you, to be completely honest, over the years, because we're talking about maybe 10 years, over the years, it had really gotten kind of wild and woolly. It was less like a bush and more like a, a, a tree, kind of. But now, not only had the branches been cut really, really short, I don't think there was a leaf on it. And I looked at it, and Bill's laughing at me. <laughs> I looked at that, and I was crushed. Man, I remember just standing there thinking that the only plant that had survived my care and gardening was a garner. Because without the branches, I thought there was no way this lilac was going to live. Now, that's the story of my lilac, part one. Of course, if you're wondering, there's really a reason why I told you all this this morning. You see, what I felt as I saw my lilac bush, I think is pretty close to what a lot of Christians feel as they look at the church. And I'm talking about the church in the United States. And you know, when you consider the statistics, I think we have every reason to be as uncertain and as discouraged as I felt when I was looking at my lilac. For example, yesterday I was going through some of the statistics. And I'll tell you, have you read, seen some of the statistics about the church? Man, it's nothing to write home about. I mean, according to an article that was published last month, so it wasn't published like five years ago, it was last month, and it was based on information from Gallup surveys. In the 35 years I've been a minister, the membership in churches, synagogues, and mosques has declined from about 70% 35 years ago, which is, by the way, the same percentage as it was when I was born. It has declined from 70% to around 47%. 47%, less than half the people in the United States are affiliated with some religious body. Now that's over 20 points in three and a half decades. And I'll tell you something else, almost half of that decline has taken place in the last five years. Half of the decline. 10 points in the last five years. And I'll tell you, if that's not discouraging enough, although for baby boomers like me, our membership is still somewhere around 60%. For millennials, and that's not even the age of my daughter. These are folks who were born between the years 1981 and 1996. Their membership is 35%. Lord knows what it is for, for, for Maggie. Now, 10 years ago for millennials, it was at 50%. Now, those are the cold, impartial statistics. But you know, 
we really don't need to read a bunch of numbers to know that the American church is in decline, do we? I mean, let's get real. I think we can all see that most congregations are getting smaller, right? They're getting smaller. And those of us who are involved in those congregations are getting what? Older. Look around. And even though we've gotten pretty good at making excuses, and oh man, we make a lot of excuses, and identifying exceptions, well, you've got to look at this church. Do you know how many, how many churches in the United States are growing? Do you know how many churches are growing? Six percent. Six percent. Six percent. Well, look at those six <laughs> percent. And of course, we're great at assigning blame. Well, we know why it's happening. It's because of what? Them. That doesn't change anything, does it? That doesn't really change anything. At least it hasn't in the last five years when involvement has dropped 10%. No, the decline is real. And you know, for that reason, well, it's not hard to understand how Christians, and I'm talking about people who have dedicated themselves to, to Jesus Christ in the church, it's easy to understand how they can become uncertain and discouraged, at least as much as I felt when I looked at my lilac bush. I remember back when I was a boy, and gosh, boy, that, that would have made it like 20 years ago. <coughs> The man in the flamingo shirt call. <laughs> no, when I was a boy, the minister in the Presbyterian congregation my family attended, he used to say, and I remembered, he used to say, the church is one generation from extinction. One generation from extinction. Now, that was in the late 60s, he said. it, And at that time, 70% of Americans had a religious affiliation somewhere. I wonder what he would say today. And although I am far closer to the end of my ministry than I am to the beginning, frankly, I worry about what I'm leaving my daughter and her children. I'll tell you, when I read the statistics and see what's happening, there are times when I worry that what that minister said over 50 years ago, man, it just might be true. And I'll tell you something else. I have talked to enough church people, even some of y'all here. I've talked to enough church people to know that I am not alone in feeling that way. In fact, I can sure understand how easy it is to see our condition as terminal. And then to just shrug our shoulders and accept it. And keep doing what we have always done until the last person left does what? Turns out the lights and locks the door. It's like we've entered some kind of ecclesiastical hospice. And brothers and sisters, that's a sad place to be. But listen to me. Before we resign ourselves to what the numbers and our senses may tell us is unavoidable and inescapable. I think we need to pause and look at the passage we just read from John. And I'll tell you why. When we really take these words from Jesus seriously, and when we apply them to our situation and to our life, not only do I think we can avoid some of the uncertainty and discouragement we often experience, I believe we can find two really good reasons to feel some real confidence and some genuine hope. And like I said, it's right here in this passage. I mean, using the image of the vine and the branches, first, I think we can trust in the quality of the vine if we want to experience real confidence. You know, the one in whom we're connected and from whom we draw our strength. Remember, Jesus said this to his disciples. He said, I am the true vine. 
Stay joined to me and I will stay joined to you. Just as a branch cannot produce fruit unless it stays joined to the vine, you cannot produce fruit unless you stay joined to me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you stay joined to me and I stay joined to you, then you will produce lots of fruit. Stay joined to me and let my teachings become part of you. Then you can pray for whatever you want and your prayers will be answered. When you become fruitful, uh, fruitful disciples of mine, my Father will be honored. You see, regardless of what we might think, and regardless of what we might say, man, regardless of what we might do, the vine, the reality of Jesus Christ just doesn't change. And when we're joined to Him and doing what He has called us to do in the way He's called us to do it, and that's important, man, we are going to produce fruit. We're going to do it. Now, I want you to notice, I didn't say we might produce fruit or we could produce fruit or we should produce fruit. I didn't say that we are going to be fruitful. In fact, using his own words, we're going to produce what? A lot of fruit. That's what he says. And the reason for that is clear. If we as individuals and as a community, if we're joined to Jesus and if his teachings have become part of us, then we know exactly what we've been called to do. We know what we've been called to do. We really do. It's no mystery. I mean, in John, right after he identified himself as the vine and us as the branches, this is what Jesus said. He said, I have loved you just as my Father has loved me, so remain faithful to my love for you. If you obey me, I will keep loving you just as my Father keeps loving me because I have obeyed him. I have told you this to make you as completely happy as I am. Now I tell you, should be a drum roll, now I tell you to love each other. To love each other as I have loved you. The greatest way to show love for friends is to die for them. You are my friends if you obey me. I'll tell you, there's no way around it. Our job as Christians and our job as the church is to do what? What is our job? What's our job? To love one another. To love others. It's not rocket science. And even though we, may, we might have to express that love in ways that are a little different than we did 35 years ago, the love and the kindness and the willingness to sacrifice ourselves for the sake of our neighbors, man, that hasn't changed. You see, when we trust the quality of the vine, we have every reason to be confident. And that's the first thing we can take from this passage. And second, I believe we can feel genuine hope the minute we trust in the skill of the gardener. In other words, the one who prunes and shapes the plant so that it can be most productive. Again, just listen to what Jesus Christ said. I am the true vine and my father is what? The gardener. He cuts away every branch of mine that does not produce fruit. But he trims clean every branch that does produce fruit so that it can produce even more fruit. You are already clean because of what I have said to you. I'll tell you whether we like it or not. The Father is working to make us as productive as we are capable of being. In other words, we're being pruned and we're being trimmed so that we can effectively show and share the love of God to those around us. That's what the gardener's doing. Because that's the gardener's job. He prunes and trims. Of course, I can understand how the idea that unproductive branches are going to be what? Cut away. And if a branch is detached, 
it's going to be thrown into the fire. Man, that can be pretty scary, right? But what if we viewed this pruning and trimming as dealing with what we do rather than who we are? In other words, instead of seeing God cutting away unproductive people and cutting away unproductive churches and casting them out, suppose he's leading us to cut away those actions and those attitudes that may explain at least in part why church membership has seen such a dramatic decline in the last 20 years. You see, maybe the way we communicate and demonstrate our Christian love, maybe it needs to be reshaped a little bit so that it has meaning to a new generation living in a new world. And even though that may mean saying goodbye to some of the things that are so meaningful to us, man, they really are. And doing that is both difficult and painful. Maybe some of those old forms are stifling our ability to be fruitful. Maybe they need to be pruned and trimmed so that new growth can take place. Of course, how that might be done Man, that is difficult to know, isn't it? And that's why it's so important for, uh, for us to recognize that we have one heck of a gardener. And he really knows what's best. And he'll show us the way we should move. And I'll tell you something else. He'll comfort us as we let go of some of those things that we valued from the past so that we can be more productive as we head into the future. And that's why I think we can feel genuine hope when we trust in the skill of the gardener. And that's the second thing we can take from this passage. And you know, it's kind of interesting. That's really what I saw happen with my lilac. Remember I told you part one? This is part two. You see, my friend, even though man, I took his name in vain when I saw that lilac, my friend really knew what he was doing when he cut back the bush. And clearly what he left was far stronger and more resilient than I thought. You see, even though it looked awful in October, and I grumbled. And it looked awful in November, and I grumbled. And it looked awful all winter, and I grumbled. Something amazing happened in the spring, and you know what I'm talking about. All along those little stumps, he left with these little green shoots. And as summer passed, those shoots became little branches. You see, not only did the plant live, it grew into something far more attractive than it was before. Because instead of being this tall, spindly looking tree that I loved, it was now a real bush covered with flowers. And that, my friends, is the story of my lilac. And I'll tell you, I see absolutely no reason why it can't be our story as the church as well. And it will when we decide to trust the quality of the vine and the skill of the gardener. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, we, our world is a scary place. It really is. 
And as we, we look at, our, at our, our church, as we look at the church, as we look at ourselves, man, we're not sure we can, we can face it. You know, the world is a tough place and we seem to be in decline. And you know what? We are. When we feel discouraged, Lord, remind us that you are the vine. And because you are the vine, you are the source of life. And also remind us that we got a gardener who has skill. That even though we may, we may be pruned in some of the things that we treasure so much, we may have to let go. Even though that may happen. You're preparing us for new life. Lord God, remind us of that in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now, before we stand and sing this last hymn, and I don't know what page it's on. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, I offer to you all this every thank you, page four, which is actually page two, which is really page three. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Let me offer you all this invitation. If there's anybody here who might feel the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and is interested in how he or she might respond, please talk to me after the service. If you've got a question about the service or the sermon, don't hesitate asking me about that. In fact, I'll be here on Monday and Wednesday, right, sitting in that office. Just give me a call or drop by. Tim knows, right? That I'm, <laughs> I'm here. I might have a dog with me. Uh, but I'll be here. Uh, so you're just, well, I'd love to talk to you about it. Let's all stand and let's sing the hymn that's there in your bulletin, uh, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Brothers and sisters, go now in peace. And remember, we are connected to the vine, and we have the best gardener around. Find comfort and support in this. 
but also be challenged to take the word and the love of God out into the world. And to empower this challenge, receive the blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Amen.